All right, this should be the last video on qualitative hedonism, one of the uh, big uh, changes to utilitarianism that Mill doesn't admit he's making in chapter two. Now, I've told you both that uh, qualitative hedonism is a way around the healthy heroin problem for hedonism. Hedonism seems like it's going to tell you to pick the healthy heroin life, but the healthy heroin life is terrible, right? It's not a life fit for human beings. So Mill says, oh, the healthy heroin life only comes out on top if you only consider quantity, but we should also consider quality. That seems totally reasonable. Now, I've explored with you um, the fact that there's different ways quality could matter, and it's not clear, A, which one Mill believes. It's also not clear which one's better. Right? Uh, it seems like there's potential objections to both, but I'll come back to that in a minute. I also told you there were two ways that Mill characterizes the difference between high quality and low quality pleasures. One is through this test, the qualified judges test. He said, like, well, just go find people who've experienced both and ask them which they prefer right, in any amounts. Right? And if some, if there's something that, like, everybody who tries both, like, they prefer one of them over the other and it doesn't matter how much of each you get, then the one they prefer, that's the higher quality one. But there's another way. And... Mill characterizes it as intellectual desires. Now, the relationship um, between uh, these two different ways of characterizing it is um, potentially interesting. One thing you can say is that what Mill's essentially doing is he's predicting what the qualified judges would say. So what, here's what he's essentially predicting. People who've experienced intellectual pleasures and non-intellectual pleasures will choose the intellectual pleasures over any amount of the non-intellectual pleasures. So what are the intellectual pleasures? Well, music, poetry, great books, right? Um, learning, you know, the truth about the universe. Like Mill would put like scientific learning in there, like coming to understand the way things work. Reading a good book of history. What would be the non-intellectual pleasures? Well, and this is going to sound familiar, the kind of things animals do. Because Mill's going to end up making some very Aristotelian sounding points here. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But one way you can treat this idea that the higher quality pleasures are the intellectual ones is he's just making a prediction about what the judges would find. So that the qualified judges thing is still the ultimate distinct way of distinguishing high from low quality. And Mill just says, and I bet when you ask them, they're all going to prefer the intellectual pleasures. This, I think, is actually the uh, way of understanding it that fits best with the text. Unfortunately, it seems really wrong, right? Like, we've, you've probably met people, or if you haven't, you probably one day will meet people who've experienced high intellectual pleasures, but would rather just go get drunk or would rather go ride roller coasters. Now, not everybody, but some, and Mill says all or almost all qualified judges have to agree for that qualified judges test to make one pleasure higher quality than the other, or to show that one uh, pleasure is higher quality than another. And so as a prediction, this doesn't seem all that good. It seems like it's almost an independent way of figuring out what the high quality pleasures are, especially when you consider the fact that Mill says the proper pleasures for us are the pleasures that are distinctive of us. And by us, he means human beings. He says there are things that human beings are sort of, in a sense, built to do. And the high quality pleasures for us are the pleasures we get from doing those things. Or basically, the exact same argument Aristotle made back when he was talking about the function argument. Remember that Aristotle said, um, the virtues, the virtuous life, the happy life, is going to be the life in which you fulfill the human function. To have a good human life is to be a good human. To be a good human is to do the things characteristic of humans. And Mill isn't quite saying that. He's not saying the life you lead should be the life uh, where you use the characteristic human capacities. But what he says is very close because he says there are certain pleasures only human beings can have. And if you're a human being, you ought to pre prefer those pleasures to the pleasures that like any animal could have. 
So Mill is sort of building in this Aristotelian idea that the proper life for human beings is the um, distinctively human life. He's building it into hedonism by saying the proper pleasures for a human being are the pleasures that really only a human being can have. Well, what's the difference between us and the other animals? Intellect, right? Any animal can enjoy its food. Any animal can, um, I mean, not naturally, but you can get animals high. Right? Uh, you can inject them with drugs. And it's going to work the same way for them that it does for us, at least for some of them. Um, like they do tests on rats where they give them CBD and stuff like that. Right? Uh, uh, animals enjoy sex. Animals enjoy just like laying down in the sunshine, stuff like that. What Mill says, he's got this famous quote, better to be a Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. The idea is better to pursue those intellectual pleasures even if you don't experience those pleasures often than to, be, to live a life of a pig where you have these easy to satisfy desires and you just satisfy them all the time. Mill thinks that's what makes a better life. A better life is one where you're pursuing the distinctively human intellectual pleasures. And you should choose that, even if there's less pleasure in it, over a uh, life where you pursue the really easy to satisfy pleasures, which he thinks those will be the animal ones. Right? It's really easy to um, cause yourself to have pleasure by uh, pursuing your basest animal desires. Right. Now, this is, um, like I said, it could just be a prediction about what the qualified judges will pick. He thinks the qualified judges will always pick the uh, intellectual pleasures. Or it could be that what Mill actually wants to do is just build in the Aristotelian account of what makes a good life. But Remember, the Aristotelian account of what makes a good life isn't a kind of hedonism. It um, is a rejection of hedonism. And there have always been some people who thought, Mill's not really a hedonist. Um, Mill's not just building quality into hedonism. He's actually replacing hedonism with basically Aristotle's account of the good. Now, it wouldn't mean he's accepting Aristotle's whole theory, because there's still that other part of utilitarianism. That an action is right just if it has the right consequences. And as we'll discuss in a later video, that still is going to set him apart from Aristotle. But there's some people who think Mill just thinks the good is people living good human lives. And people living good human lives are people who live lives that use the distinctive human capacities. Um, this is an ongoing debate um, in Mill scholarship about uh, how hedonistic Mill really is. There are some people who think what's going on in this book is Mill is defending his dad and his godfather, even though he's really come to fundamentally disagree with them. That it's not just a minor revision. It's not just adding quality in. It's actually that Mill's not a hedonist anymore. But then again, he, he says he is. He says pleasure is the good, right? He just says when you're figuring out which pleasure is better than another, consider quality. Now, this brings us back to something I promised to get to at the end of the last video, which was a way to maybe understand um, which answer is correct when it comes to the multiplier view versus the Trump view. Uh, the multiplier view says quality just acts as a multiplier, right? So that um, if one quality, if one pleasure is higher quality than another, then you take its quantity and you multiply it by whatever level of quality it has. The other is you always pick high quality pleasures over low quality pleasures. Now, one way of reading Mill is he actually means you to do this for each particular pleasure you run into, right? Like when you're considering roller coasters or poetry, right? Um, uh, Justin Bieber or Mozart, right? Although Justin Bieber wouldn't give me any pleasure of a high or low quality kind, but I know some of you it would. Um, you could think, here's what Mill's saying, for each and every pleasure, you have to submit it to this test. But there's a different way of reading it. The different way of reading them is you're not choosing between pleasures, particular pleasures. You're choosing between kinds of lives. Right? You're not saying for each and every time, um, 
uh, you're considering what to do, always go with the high quality pleasure because that gets old after a while. Sometimes you just like doing stupid stuff, right? Like I like riding roller coasters. I've got a fancy PhD from a fancy Ivy League university and blah, 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 blah. I like riding roller coasters. Roller coasters are fun, right? Am I thinking deep thoughts while I ride the roller coaster? No, right? Went to Disney World with my family and my kids, didn't think a deep thought once. Did have to clean up their vomit a bunch of times, though, because kids eat like crap at Disney World. They just eat like the bluest, grossest stuff, and it comes out blue and gross on the other end. Story for a different time, not for, you know, class. Um, but even really smart people, which I consider myself to be, uh, are going to pick stupid pleasures from time to time. And if Mill's actually saying, no, you should never do that, then like, go to hell, Mill. But there's some people who think, no, that's not what Mill's saying. Mill certainly did stupid stuff from time to time, right? Mill certainly, like, um, uh, just laid out in a hammock someday and was like, hmm, sunshine sure is nice, right? And if, like, Mill had dope, Mill probably smoked some dope, right? He was like, yeah, this is fun. Right? No, it's okay to be dumb sometimes. What people have read Mill to say, and I think this is so much more plausible that I think we should probably just read Mill this way because Mill was a smart guy is that it's really about choosing what kind of life you're gonna lead. Because you do have to make some very conscious decisions to have available to you in your life these intellectual pleasures. You have to cultivate the ability to enjoy those things in yourself. It's not just something you can like just start doing. Like you can live your whole life, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and then you get to be 65 and you're like, I'm gonna take up reading. No, if you haven't read a book, between like high school and age 65, you're probably not gonna be able to sit still long enough to read a book at age 65. You're not gonna have developed the talent or ability. It takes work to enjoy some of these things, right? Um, if you've ever had the experience of, for example, classical music. When I was like 15, couldn't stand classical music. Hated listening to it. I wanted, I mean, I honestly wanted Metallica. Um, uh, but over time, I realized, well, lots of smart people, lots of people who are like really cool. They like classical music. I'm going to give it a shot. So I forced myself to listen to it. I forced myself to listen hard and carefully. And slowly I developed the ability to appreciate things about classical music that I didn't appreciate before. It takes work, in other words. So you have to make these choices. You have to make the choices about what kind of life you're going to try to lead. And what Mill's saying is a life with high quality pleasures in it should always be chosen over a life with none. And that becomes much more plausible. He's not saying pick the life where there's only high quality intellectual pleasures. He's just saying never choose the life without any. Now, if you want to then ask, well, which qualities are the high quality ones? Well, then go back to this test. And now you're saying if the qualified judges would pick a life with this pleasure in it over a life without it, no matter how much other pleasure you get, then that pleasure, that first pleasure, P2 here, is a high quality pleasure. If you're talking about choosing lives, Mill's qualitative hedonism becomes much more plausible and it becomes much more plausible that it operates as a trump. And this avoids this whole oyster example, right? Um, because, uh, uh, well, I mean, by having it be the trump view. Okay, so, um, there is a plausible view here. There are still questions like, has Mill actually abandoned hedonism, but he's too loyal to his family members to actually admit that. Um, and there's also a question like, is he talking about comparing individual pleasures or is he talking about comparing whole lives? Um, I want though to come back to the experience machine. What I said about the experience machine is like, this is kind of a sci-fi example. Let's have something a little more plausible. Then I went to healthy heroin. Healthy heroin example, right? is, and remember the way this works, is you can choose between a life where you're hooked up to a heroin drip that doesn't kill you um, or not. And it seems like hedonism suggests you should hook up to the heroin, but that seems like a really bad idea. That seems like your life is going to suck. You're just not going to know it because you're going to be a drooling heroin-addled fool. Qualitative hedonism definitely gets around healthy heroin, right? Healthy heroin, no longer a problem with qualitative hedonism. Original hedonism, healthy heroin was a problem. Qualitative hedonism, no matter what way you interpret it, allows you to say, no, don't, don't take the heroin for the rest of your life. But let's go back to the experience machine. 
does the experience machine, do you get the right answer to the experience machine question with qualitative hedonism? Well, if you think the right answer is don't hook up to the experience machine, don't spend your life in a bed where you're just tricked into thinking you're doing things. If you think that's the right answer, if you think the right answer is don't hook up to the experience machine, then qualitative hedonism doesn't seem like it's going to help you because it still says it's the pleasures that are important and you're experiencing those pleasures. You can experience intellectual pleasures in the experience machine, right? Like the guy who runs the experience machine could just say, I've loaded every book, every symphony ever written. I've loaded like every work of art that's ever been made. Right. I've loaded all the knowledge um, human beings have gathered about every subject into this machine. You can access any of it. In fact, you could experience probably more intellectual pleasures in the experience machine than you could in regular life because you could select a world, right, a fantasy world where all of your needs are met by like robots. And that frees you up to just spend all your time pursuing intellectual pleasures. So if you think the right answer to the experience machine is don't hook up. Don't live a life where you're tricked into thinking you're doing things by some machine. Live a life where you actually try to do them. Live a life where you actually achieve things. Don't, not a life where you're tricked into achieving things. Qualitative hedonism then still won't be the view for you. And here's where it matters. Maybe Mill was ditching hedonism entirely because what hedonism says is what's fundamentally the good in the world, what's fundamentally valuable and worthwhile are experiences in your head, right? The pleasure is inside you. And that means it can be reproduced by the experience machine. But if it's actually about developing your human capacities, not just developing the um, ability to have the distinctive human pleasures, but if it's Aristotle's view, well, on Aristotle's view, if you're hooked up to the experience machine, your life sucks because you're not actually becoming good at the things that human beings are supposed to become good at. You're not actually making decisions about how your life should go that employs reason, which is what Aristotle's view was. So if Mill was actually ditching hedonism entirely, and in place of hedonism, putting something like Aristotle's view of what makes for a good human life, then there'd be a way around the experience machine. Or if you take Mill at face value, Mill would have to answer, if you, like where he says, pleasure is what's good. They would have to answer that the experience machine is the right decision. But at the very least, we can say that Mill is safe from examples like the healthy heroin example. All right, so that's been what Mill has to say, and it took three videos to do it, about the hedonism part of classic utilitarianism. He's changing it. He's adding a qualitative aspect to it. Maybe he's going so far as to ditch hedonism entirely. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what Mill thought. I mean, we're studying Mill, so it matters to that extent. But if you're actually going to decide for yourself how to live, then what really matters is you can be a kind of utilitarian and ditch hedonism completely. Some people think that's what Mill did. Later utilitarians have done so, or people who called themselves utilitarians anyway. They've ditched hedonism entirely. And I'll talk about that in um, another video. So after we're done going through what Mill says, I'll have a wrap-up video talking about what um, uh, utilitarianism sort of did later. But this has been it for um, talking about hedonism in Mill's utilitarianism.